Chapter 7. For the next three weeks, Arietti was especially good. She helped her mother tidy the storerooms. She swept and watered the passages and trod them down. She sorted and grated the beads, which they used as buttons, into the screw tops of aspirin bottles. She cut old kid gloves into squares for pods shoe making. She filed fishbone needles to a bee sting sharpness. She hung up the washing to dry by the grating so that it blew in the soft air. And at last, the day came, that dreadful, wonderful, never-to-be-forgotten day, when Homily, scrubbing the kitchen table, straightened her back and called, Pod? He came in from his workroom, last in hand. Look at this brush, cried Homily. It was a fiber brush with a uh, plated fiber back. Aye, said Pod, worn down. Gets me knuckles now, said Homily, every time I scrub. Pod looked worried. Since he had been seen, they had stuck to kitchen borrowing, the bare essentials of fuel and food. There was an old mouse hole above the, under the kitchen stove upstairs, which at night, when the fire was out or very low, Pod could use as a chute to save carrying. Since the window curtain incident, they had pushed a matchbox chest of drawers below the mouse hole and had stood a wooden stool on the chest of drawers. And Pod, with much help and shoving from homily, had learned to squeeze up the chute instead of down. In this way, he need not venture into the great hall and passage and passages. He could just nip out from under the vast black stove in the kitchen for a clove or a carrot or a tasty piece of ham. But it was not, satis not a satisfactory arrangement. Even when the fire was out, often there was hot ash and cinders under the stove, and once, as he emerged, a great brush came at him, wielded by Mrs. Driver, and he slithered back on top of homily, singed, shaken, and coughing dust. Another time, for some reason, the fire had been in full blaze, and Pod had arrived suddenly beneath a glowing inferno, dropping white-hot coals. But usually at night, the fire was out, and Pod could pick his way through the cinders and into the kitchen proper. Mrs. Driver's out, homily went on. It's her day off, and she, they always spoke of Aunt Sophia as she, is safe enough in bed. It's not them that worries me, said Pod. Why, exclaimed homily sharply, the boy's not still here. I don't know, said Pod. There's always a risk, he added. And there always will be, retorted Homily, like when you was in the coal cellar and the coal cart came. But the other two, said Pod, Mrs. Driver and her, I always know where they are like. As for that, exclaimed Homily, a boy's even better. You can hear a boy a mile off. Well, she went after a moment. Please yourself, but it's not like you talk of risks. But it's not like you to talk of risks. Pod sighed. All right, he said, and turned away to fetch his borrowing bag. Take the child, called Homily after him. Pod turned. Now, Homily, he began in an alarmed voice. Why not? asked Hom Homily sharply. It's just the day. You aren't going no farther than the front door. If you're nervous, you can leave her by the clock, ready to nip underneath and down the hole. Just let her see at any rate. Arietti. As Arietti came running in, Pod tried again. Now listen, Homily, he protested. Homily ignored him. Arietti, she said brightly, would you like to go along with your father and borrow me some brush fibers from the doormat in the hall? Arietti gave a little skip. Oh, she cried, could I? Well, take your apron off, said Homily, and change your boots. You want light shoes for borrowing. Better wear the red kid. And then, as Arietti spun away, Homily turned to Pod. She'll be all right, she said. You'll see. As she followed her father down the passage, Arietti's heart began to beat faster. Now the moment had come at last, she found it almost too much to bear. She felt light and, and trembly and hollow with excitement. They had three borrowing bags between the two of them. In case, Pod had explained, we pick up something. A bad borrower loses many a chance for a lack of extra bag. And Pod laid these down to open the first gate, which was last, latched by a safety pin. It was a big pin, too strongly sprung for little hands to open. And Arietti watched her father swing his whole weight on the bar and his feet kick loose off the ground. Hanging from his hands, he shifted his weight along the pin toward the curved sheet. And as he moved, the pin sprang open and he, in the same instant, jumped free. You couldn't do that, he remarked, dusting his hands. Too late, nor could your mother. Come along now, quietly. There were other gates, all of which Pod had left open. Never shut a gate on the way out. Um, he explained in a whisper, you might need to get back quick. And after a while, Arietti saw a faint light at the end of the passage. She pulled her father's sleeve. Is that it? She whispered. Pod stood still. 
quietly now. He warned her. Yes, that's it. The hole under the clock. And as he said these words, Ariadne felt breathless, but outwardly she made no sign. There are three steps up to it, Pod went on, steep-like, so mind how you go. When you're under the clock, you just stay there. Don't let your mind wander and keep your eyes on me. If all's clear, I'll give you the sign. The steps were high and a little uneven, but Ariadne took them more lightly than Pod. As she scrambled past the jagged edges of the hole, she had a sudden blinding glimpse of molten gold. It was spring sunshine on the pale stones of the hall floor. Standing upright, she could no longer see this. She could only see the cave-like shadows in the great case above her and the dim outline of hanging weights. The hollow darkness around her vibrated with sound. It was a safe sound, solid and regular. And far above her head, she saw the movement of the pendulum. It gleamed a little in the half-light, remote and cautious in its rhythmic swing. Ariadne felt warm tears behind her eyelids and a sudden swelling pride. So this, at last, was the clock. Their clock, after which her family was named. For 200 years it had stood there, deep voice and patient, guarding their threshold and measuring their time. The pod she saw stood crouched beneath the carved archway against the light. Keep your eyes on me, he had said, so Ariadne crouched too. She saw the gleaming golden stone floor of the hall stretching away into the distance. She saw the edges of, the, of runs, like richly colored islands in a molten sea. She saw, in a glory of sunlight, like a dreamed-of getaway to a fairyland, the open front door. Beyond, she saw grass, and again, the clear, bright sky, a waving frond of green. Pod's eyes slewed around. Wait, he breathed, and watch. And in a flash, he was gone. Ariadne saw him scurry across the sunlit floor. Swiftly, he ran, as a mouse runs, or a blow-dry leaf. A blown dry leaf. And suddenly, she saw him as small. But she told herself, he isn't small. He's half a head taller than mother. She watched him run a chestnut-colored island of doormat into the shadows beside the door. There, it seemed, he became invisible. Ariadne watched and waited. All was still, except for a sudden whir within the clock. A grinding whir it was, up high in the hollow darkness above her head. And then the sliding grate of slipped metal before the clock sang out its chime. Three notes were struck deliberate and mellow. Take it or leave it, they seem to say, but that's the time. A sudden movement near the shadowed lintel of the front door, and there was Pot again, bag in hand, beside the mat. It rose knee-deep before him like a field of chestnut corn. Ariadne saw him glance toward the clock, and then she saw him raise his hand. Oh, the warmth of the stone flags as she ran across them, the gladdening sunlight on her face and hands, the awful space above and around her. Pod caught her and held her at last and patted her shoulder. There, there, he said. Get your breath. Good girl. Panting a little, Ariadne gazed about her. She saw great chair legs rearing up into sunlight. She saw the shadowed undersides of their seats spread above her like canopies. She saw the nails and the strappings and odd tags of silk and string. She saw the terrace cliffs of the stairs mounting up into the distance, up and up. She saw carved table legs and a cavern under the chest. And all the time, in the stillness, the clock spoke, measuring out the seconds, spreading its layers of calm. And then, turning, Ariadne looked at the garden. She saw a graveled path full of colored stones, the size of walnuts they were. Here and there, a blaze of grass, a blade of grass between them, transparent green against the light of the sun. Beyond the path, she saw grassy banks rising steeply to a tangled hedge. And beyond the hedge, she saw fruit trees, bright with blossom. Here's a bag, said Pod in a hoarse whisper. Better get down to work. Obediently, Ariadne started pulling fiber. Stiff it was and full of dust. Pod worked swiftly and methodically, making small bundles, each of which he put immediately in the bag. If you have to run suddenly, he explained, you don't want to leave nothing behind. It hurts your hands, said Ariadne, doesn't it? And suddenly she sneezed. Not my hands, it doesn't, said Pod. They're hardened like. And Ariadne sneezed again. Dusty, isn't it? She said. Pod straightened his back. No good pulling where it's not it right in, he said, watching her. No wonder it hurts your hands. See here, he exclaimed after a moment. You leave it. It's your first time up like. You sit on the step and take a peek out of doors. Oh, no, Ariadne began. If I don't help, she thought, he won't want me again. But Pod insisted. I'm better on me own, he said. I can choose me bits, if you see what I mean. Seeing as it's me who got to make the brush, 